Hey, it's Shannon, and welcome to a Creative Workflow Lab video tutorial. You can get some amazing results with Midjourney, and the web interface makes it a lot easier to use. When you first log into midjourney.com, you'll land at the Explore page, but we're going to head over to the Create tab on the left-hand side. You just click on Create. This is where the magic happens. Here you can see all of your previous generations, and at the top here, this is where you can type in your prompts, and if you click on this Adjustment icon here, it will pop open these settings. Now I wanna take this one step at a time. So before we get into all these settings, I just wanna show you what it's like to generate a photo. So I'm gonna type in train and just hit enter. Midjourney will immediately start generating four photos at a time. By default, Midjourney will generate square photos and you can click on any of these to see it in a larger view. Now on the right hand side, you can see your previous generations and you can scroll to quickly move between each photo. I'll get into some more complex prompting techniques a little bit later, but first I wanna walk you through the adjustment options that you have by just clicking this adjustment icon so you understand what all of these sliders and buttons mean. So let's start with image size. As I mentioned, the default is square, but you can slide it over to the right to get more of a landscape aspect ratio. You can see the aspect ratio is listed right here. And if we slide it over to the left, we're going to get more of a portrait aspect ratio, such as 916. That's the aspect ratio you'd see on TikTok or YouTube Shorts. There is no correct aspect ratio to use. It's up to you, and it just really depends on the use case for what you're gonna use the photo for. You can also just click these buttons. It makes it a little bit simpler. If you get confused by all these aspect ratio numbers I'm saying, you could just click these buttons, you know, portrait, self-explanatory, square, landscape. Personally, unless I'm creating an image that I know will be used in a YouTube Short or an Instagram video, I usually won't create my images in portrait, I'll typically slide it over to 16-9 aspect ratio because that's the standard aspect ratio for horizontal landscape videos. For example, if you watch a typical YouTube video or a Netflix show, that'll be in 16-9. The next panel is the aesthetics panel here. So here you have stylization, weirdness, and variety. The web interface is already so much easier to use because you can actually hover over each of these and it gives you a little description of what each of these can do. Now in Discord, if you ever used Midjourney in Discord, these were known as parameters and you can see the parameter dash dash stylize is listed there. You can still use those parameters if you just type them in up in the text box here, but this is an easier way to add these parameters and make these adjustments without having to almost become a coder or know how to, you know, or know these parameters. You can just play with these sliders. So stylization is a reference to the mid-journey aesthetic. So mid-journey has an artistic aesthetic that it preferences, and the more you slide this towards a higher number, which the highest is a thousand, that's going to give you more of that mid-journey aesthetic, which is more artistic typically. Some of these words can be subjective, so I encourage you to play with it. Even with the cheapest $10 a month plan, you get a lot of images to work with per month, so I encourage you to just try things out. Play with these sliders, see what it does. You know, don't be afraid to generate a whole bunch of images because the best way to learn how to use AI tools is to experiment with a high volume of outputs because the nature of generative AI is that each output is going to be different. And sometimes you're going to get a better result. Sometimes you're going to get not as good of a result. And part of working with AI is allowing it to generate a whole bunch of outputs. And then you can curate those outputs and decide for yourself which ones you like. So I usually keep my stylization around 200. But again, play with it, see what works for you. The weirdness aesthetic slider is what it sounds like. This is going to add strange things to your image, unexpected outcomes, worth playing around with, but I don't use that one very much. Variety. This one is really important. This was previously known as the chaos parameter, but it's called variety. And honestly, I think that's a better name because this tells Midjourney to create some variety between each of the four photos that it will generate. And you can get more out of your session by sliding this up a little bit, and that way each time you hit generate, you're going to get a few different options that aren't going to all look the same. I like to keep this around 20. So there's no correct number for any of these, right? This is something that you experiment with and you will kind of change on the fly 
as you're working with Midjourney. Hey, breaking in here real quick, the tutorial will continue in just a second. This was actually supposed to be for my newsletter, creativeworkflowlab.com, but I'm gonna put more intermediate and advanced video tutorials there. But even if you are a beginner, Creative Workflow Lab has a weekly roundup that I write where it covers all the latest creative workflow, AI news, and trends from the week. So if you're interested, you can head over to creativeworkflowlab.com, sign up for free, but there's also a paid subscription. But of course, this tutorial is totally free. I'm going to be doing more beginner AI workflow tutorials on this channel. So let's get back into it. We have the mode. So this is standard versus raw. If you switch over to raw, this will essentially disable that mid-journey aesthetic entirely. We talked about that when I was adjusting the stylization slider. There is a mid-journey aesthetic, and if you switch it to raw, it just will not include that aesthetic at all in your outputs. They recommend using RAW when you're trying to create more photorealistic images or cinematic scenes because the mid-journey aesthetic is a little bit more artistic and less realistic. The version number, in my opinion, you should just set this to the most recent version of mid-journey unless you want to experiment and dive into some of these earlier versions. This could have a whole video uh, ex talking about all the different kind of versions they offer, but 6.1 is the latest one. For majority of, of your workflows, the latest... Oh, say hi to Athena. The latest version is the best. And they're going to come out with version 7 pretty soon, but so by the time you're watching this, version 7 might even be out. I might make a follow-up tutorial on that, but I don't think the web interface will change very much. It'll just be a better model that you'll be able to use. So each of these models is progressively more advanced, and in general, you'll get better outputs the higher the model number is, because it's just the most recent updated model. If I'm keeping that at 6.1, personalize is a very interesting option here. I'll quickly touch on this option right now. So I have this at off, but if I turn this on, it would apply my own personalization to the outputs. Now, what does that mean? Well, if we look here on the left-hand side, there is a whole personalized tab. And if you click that, you'll have the opportunity to spend some time ranking images. You see here, I've ranked 200 images so far. I think that's the minimum uh, number of images that will get you your personalization enabled. And after ranking those images, Midjourney will kind of see what you like. And again, it sounds kind of subjective, and that's because it is. You're not going to tell Midjourney directly what you like or dislike. You're just sort of picking between photos. And after 200 of these pair rankings, Midjourney will just get a sense for what you like. And if you turn on that setting back in the create panel and clicking on the adjustments icon, if you turn that to on, it will then apply your personalization to each photo. You can use other people's personalization codes as well. It'll kind of give you a code that's your personalization, and some people kind of share these codes, but that's kind of a more advanced thing, and you don't really have to get into that. I personally just use my own personalization, but I don't always have it on, because if I'm generating something for a project, my personalization will give it a certain look that I might not always want. So let's talk about writing the prompts. A lot of people talk about prompt engineering, and this can seem very intimidating, but honestly, I wouldn't worry about the prompts too much. Yes, you can do a lot with more complex prompts. For example, here are some previous images that I generated with Midjourney. You can see the prompt here. It's a pretty large prompt. We have, you know, a futuristic and intimate scene of a person sitting in a modern living room, and it continues. This prompt was written by ChatGPT. I told ChatGPT the kind of image I was looking for. In this case, I was generating a photo for a podcast cover photo. I told ChatGPT about the podcast, and I said, can you give me a mid-journey prompt for this? And it gave me this prompt, and I said, okay, great, this is perfect. So you really don't have to learn prompt engineering if, if you don't want to. You can just ask ChatGPT to write a prompt for you and to speak in your natural language to ChatGPT about what you're trying to create or the project that you're working on and ChatGPT or Claude or Gemini, all of these large language models can give you some really good prompts and also sort of will, might teach you about prompt structures and you can play, play around with it. I don't think there's a right way to do a prompt. I really don't. That being said, there are resources that Midjourney has shared that will kind of guide you through how to write a prompt. So I loaded up docs.midjourney.com. I'll add this link in the video notes, but this is Midjourney's explanation of how to create prompts. Now you'll notice that this is a little bit outdated. This is showing the Discord interface where you have to put these parameters there. I wouldn't worry about the parameters as much now because you can just make those adjustments with the web interface 
in the adjustment panel that I showed you. Still, you know, it talks about word choice. Here, there's a whole explore prompting page. You know, you can really dive into this. You don't really need to learn prompting. I think you'll learn it as you work with Midjourney. Even just putting in one word, train, got these pretty cool outputs. And then you can go from there. Like, let's say this is kind of too much of a painted style. I can type realistic train. And then I'm also going to go over and turn on my personalization, maybe add some variety, and then hit enter. Now, this is actually a good tip. If you are already on an image like I am now and you hit enter, and you're like, wait, where did my photo go? You can always click on the, on the side here and see if there's a number. And that means that you have one photo or maybe multiple photos waiting for you in the create panel. So just click on create, and then you'll see your generated images that you created. And it'll also be an organize as well but we'll get to that in a second. So now you can see here, these four photos are, are all different because I upped the variety a little bit. They have more of a realistic style though, because I said realistic train, but they're still really compelling. I mean, I didn't have to do some kind of complex prompt to get some pretty amazing images. I mean, this one's really cool. This is actually a great opportunity before we move on to the organized panel to kind of dive into some of the editing features that the web interface provides. Creation action options is what they call it, but really there's kind of editing options here. First, there's very and again, I love how in the web interface, you can just hover over and it gives you a description of what each of these features means. Super helpful. So you have subtle and strong. Now, subtle will regenerate this photo, but it'll change some things. And obviously, if you click subtle, it'll change things in a subtle way, or you can regenerate with the strong option and it'll change a lot more. For me, I usually just tweak the prompt instead. So if I don't like something, I'll tweak the prompt and then just regenerate from there. The upscale options, this one's super important. So since I really like this photo, I'm gonna go ahead and click upscale creative. Immediately mid-journey will start working on that in the background. Like I said, if you ever are wondering where those photos are, you can click create on the left-hand side. You can see it actually takes longer to generate the upscaled versions, but this will give you a much higher resolution image. So I'd recommend doing this for the photos that you want to use, let's say on your website or social media or kind of whatever use case, maybe a wallpaper for your computer. I've done some tests and the creative upscaling for me delivers a lot better of an output. And you can try each one and see what you like better, but I just recommend clicking creative because it doesn't actually change things too much. And let's actually look at the result now. Here's the upscaled photo. And you can see it's just already much higher resolution, but it's the same photo, right? It's not, even though it's a creative upscale, it's not changing too many things. Next, we have the zoom options. So this will allow you to zoom out of the photo and actually generate more of an image around your photo, which is really cool. You can also do that in the editor. Let's just jump into the editor because these other options here are pretty self-explanatory. You know, rerun is just rerunning this prompt. This image button will allow you to use this as the reference image for a prompt. And before I get to the editor, that is one of the features where you write your prompts up here. You can actually click this photo button and select an image to use as a reference. I just would recommend experimenting with that and seeing kind of the results you get. So let's dive into the editor right here. So this is probably one of the most powerful features. Once you click editor, you'll have a whole new interface and you have a brush. You have two options here, erase or restore. And this will allow you to actually change things within this image. Now, very soon they're coming out with what they call the full editor, which you have to have a yearly membership or over 10,000 images to access. I think I have over 1,000. By the time you're watching this, this might already have rolled out. I might make a whole nother video on this where there's some really cool options like retexturing. But for now, we'll just use the basic image editor that's available. And I'm actually gonna switch to this photo because this will give a good example of why you would wanna use the image editor. So again, in the lower right-hand corner, I'll click the editor button here. And now I'm going to use the erase option and show you how that works. So I have my brush size. I can change that with this slider at the top. And this photo is okay, but there's this kind of glitch here that doesn't, it, it just seems out of place. And so what if you wanted to remove that? Well, with the erase option, you just simply brush over that section. And then over here, you can edit the prompt. So for example, for me, I'll just edit this to wall because I don't want, there'd be anything else besides a wall right there. And then I'll hit submit. You can see it regenerated with a four in that spot, but it gave me a few different versions. That's not really the output I was looking for. So let's try again. See, this is an example of you got to experiment 
and maybe adjust your prompts, like maybe just saying blank wall, maybe even just empty wall. And I'm also gonna remove the chaos and the personalization parameter just in case that's interfering. I'm gonna submit that. You'll, so you'll either have to scroll up or click on create to see the final result. And finally that worked. So that just created the empty wall there, it got rid of that. So, okay, so this is an example of how you can use this. Now, again, the first time you do something, it might not work just like you saw there. And a huge part of using these tools is just iterating as you go. So that's a quick overview of the image editor. Final thing I wanna go over for this tutorial is the organize section. So this is a really cool part of the mid journey web interface. You know, you really didn't have anything like this in the discord version of working with mid journey. You can see all the photos that you've generated and you can go in and filter them on the right hand side. So these filters are really helpful for finding your final outputs. For example, the photos that I really like and I really want to use, I always upscale them. And so to easily find the photos that are upscaled, you just click upscales right here. Also select, you know, the photos that you liked. That's an option. To like a photo, you would just click on a photo and click this heart icon the upper right and even create folders and kind of organize that way as well. And for me, especially when I'm generating a whole bunch of images and then I just upscale a few of them that I want to use at the end of my session, I'll just go into organize and then just click upscales and it'll instantly give me all of my upscaled images that I can then download by clicking on an image and then clicking this download button in the upper right hand corner right there. There'll be more beginner tutorials on this channel totally for free. Head over to creativeworkflowlab.com for a weekly roundup of all the latest creative workflow tools and trends. See you later.